Welcome back from lunch. Our next presenter is Katie McLaughlin, who is an expert in many fields and is also a developer, sysadmin, and a member of the Linux Australia Council. Was. Was. I'm sorry, I didn't know that. I got voted off the island. Oh. <laughs> that is good because it means now she can be awesome on other islands, including this one. Katie. A um, little bit of housekeeping before we start. There is going to be a bunch of audience participation in this talk. If I ask a direct question or, and or have my hand up, feel free to shout out answers. If I don't, please don't spoil it for everyone else. Um, I don't think there's a bigger screen in this state, so this is as big of the text as you're going to get. Um, the stuff at the top is going to be what, mostly what I'll use. The stuff at the bottom, you can probably still see it, but it's not going to be as important. I'll be using a whole bunch of JavaScript in this talk as code samples, unless otherwise advised. The top line is going to be input with the um, caret symbol, and output is going to be without any indentation. Uh, uh, comments, highlights, and assume JavaScript is otherwise indicated. So let's get started. Hi, I'm Katie. Um, as Adam said, I have a bunch of different hats that I wear. Um, and if you'll indulge me, I'll read the rest of my speaker bio. Um, when I'm not doing all the other things that my hats are on, I enjoy cooking, making tapestries, and yelling at JavaScript in its attempt at global variables. When I was writing my speaker bio many, many years ago, this was something that was annoying me on a daily basis, and I couldn't get my head around it. And thus, it ended up in my speaker profile. Let me show you what I'm talking about. This is JavaScript. Say we have a variable, ands, and we initialize it with an empty string. If we then declare a function, question, which has a variable ands of 42 and we return the answer, if we ask for the output of ands, we get the empty string. That's fine. If we ask for the output of the function question, we get 42. If we then ask for the output of answer again, we get the empty string because the answer variable inside the function is not the same as the answer variable outside because of that little guy, the var. In JavaScript, to include var is to make it local. By default, everything is global. Trying to use external libraries that may or may not have been developed within best standard practices and having this bug pop up everywhere was something that annoyed me greatly. You know what else is fun in JavaScript? Duck typing. Duck typing is where if it looks like a duck, it sounds like a duck, it smells like a duck, then it's a duck. JavaScript likes to do duck typing. So, audience participation, simple round. What is four plus two? Six. Six. What is four minus two? Two. two. What is the string four minus two? Okay. Two. What is the string four plus two? Forty-two. 42. <laughs> because duck typing and assumed types and all the fun that comes with that. You know what else is fun? Equality. Is zero equal to false? Yes. Is one equal to the string one? Yes. But if we actually use triple equals instead of double equals, then they're not. Because in JavaScript, there are multiple ways to do equality. And instead of having the double equals that works mostly in other languages, let's just put another equals on it and mean actually really equal. You know what is also fun? Uh, arrays and objects. So what is the result of an empty array plus an empty array? Empty string. What about an empty array plus an empty object? object? It's an object. Somebody has seen this bit of the talk before. What about the reverse? Empty object plus empty array? Zero. <laughs> and what about the uh, addition of two empty objects? Not a number. <laughs> what? Um, some of you may recognize this duck from Gary Breinhardt's uh, Watt talk where he discusses some of the eccentricities in uh, JavaScript and Ruby. This is not a Watt talk. This is more of a hidden Watt talk, those little tiny edge cases where if you duck around the corner, you may see a Watt. So why? Why is JavaScript like this? Well, for starters, JavaScript is a registered trademark of the Oracle. Uh, company because uh, JavaScript was originally a trademark of Netscape and then Netscape got bought by Sun and then Oracle bought Sun, om nom 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 companies. So technically this is a word that's uh, under uh, US trademark law. 
um, and was also developed extremely fast in 10 days and has no versions. So that's fun. You cannot declare any specific version of JavaScript you want to use. You just use whatever you're given. The correct term for what I'm going to be discussing today is ECMAScript, a general purpose cross-platform programming language uh, standardized uh, by ECMA because W3C got a bit upset at the fact that uh, people were trying to standardize things on the web that included things like pictures and styling. So that's why it had to get uh, standardized by the European Computer Machining Association. I'm probably going to end up using the term JavaScript throughout this talk because that's what I've always called it, but just assume I'm using the right terms. So. We have billions of people using the internet. So JavaScript is the most popular language by user count ever because more often than not, you are going to be using JavaScript on your web pages. Because there are so many users, there are probably going to be as many developers as can work out how to, let's say, edit source on a page. So I posit that this is the most popular language ever. And thus you have a whole lot of people talking about JavaScript and thus you have a whole lot of noise about JavaScript and thus you see nearly all the watts of JavaScript as opposed to say uh, a less popular programming language. So let's go back to some of those examples earlier and work out why things are the way they are. Starting with global variables. The problem with our global variables in this example is scope. The top answer is global while the inner is local. This var keyword lessens the scope the variable inside the function, unless properly declared, can affect the outer variables. And this is exactly what tripped me up years ago. Because every other language that I've developed in, uh, you need to define global explicitly. The overloaded uh, addition operand. So in this example, what's happening is that uh, JavaScript is assuming in the third example, the string for minus two doesn't make sense. But hey, that string for can be assumed to be an integer, so we can do stuff on it. And the uh, different way in the last example is that, well, I can just concatenate uh, and turn the second variable into a string. And thus you get wonderful examples like this. Equality and type coercion is fun because as we had in this example, uh, the double equals is equality, but the triple equals is equality without type coercion because by default, when JavaScript was implemented, it would assume that you knew what you were doing and would try to not actually check whether objects were the same. Yes, this is a bug. This has been identified as a bug. And uh, the original developer of JavaScript keeps on telling people that, yes, he knows. That's why there's a triple equals now. Some other interesting examples. Uh, parse int. If we try to parse the string 42, we get 42. If we try to parse a string that begins with 42 and then has other characters, we get 42. If we try to parse an uh, integer that starts with a 0, say 0, 4, we get 4. But if we try to do it with 0, 8, we get 0. This is because by default for parse int, it assumes that anything starting with a 0 is octal. Octal being base 8, which means there's no 8 decimal number, which means that 0, 8 is an invalid octal. So we get 0. And numbers are fun in JavaScript. Uh, so back to our easy example earlier. What is 4 plus 2? 6. What is 40 plus 20? 60. What is 0 0.4 plus 0 0.2? 0 0.6000000001, 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 because everything in JavaScript that is a number is actually a float. Imagine doing math with this. It is fun. The extended character set as well. Now, uh, normally I do an emoji talk, so I'm going to have an emoji example in here because I can. Um, so if we have a string, ABC, and we want to split it into its individual characters, we would use dot split, and we would get an array of A, B, and C. If we wanted to do that with the official conference emoji, penguin koala, we get broken stuff. Now, this is because the Unicode standard was being developed around the same time that JavaScript was. So by default, some of the fundamental functionality does not allow Unicode. But we can have uh, extensions from prototypes so we can use array.from, which will work. So that's fun. You know what else is fun? This thing. Anyone has to guess what this thing evaluates to? 10. Now, let's walk through that. We have an empty array. 
and an empty array is the same as an empty string. We can have a unary operand in front of that to cast it to an integer. What we can also do is we can have a nested array, which is actually an array of a single empty string, but then we can have that and then have the indexes as index zero before, which returns the same empty string. However, in this format, we can cast it into an integer and then increment it. And then if you put the two together, you end up getting your 10. Given this, no, it gets better. <laughs> Add in some uh, binary knots in there and you get code like this. Anyone want to hazard a guess at what this evaluates to? <laughs> Using only six characters, unary plus, not, open parentheses, close parentheses, and open bracket, close bracket, you can implement anything. Yeah. I'm waiting for Pierre to take a photo. You're welcome. That's okay. I like photos. Um, type of. So with type of, we can introspect what type an object is. So what would be the type of this? Object. Okay, so the curly brace is normally an object. So we knew before that our brackets was an array, right? No. It's an object. Now this is where it gets fun. What is the type of object? Object. What is the type of number? Number. These aren't trick questions. What are you talking about? What is the type of string? String. What is the type of Boolean? Boolean. What is the type of null? Yes. Now, there is a really, really important reason for this, and it has to do with the underlying representation of these object types. The tag prefix used in the underlying C code uh, has tags in front of these object types. So for string, it's a four. For Boolean, it's a six. For object, it's a zero, and null pointer also has a zero. So if we go to the original JS API from October 1996, we get this bit of C code. It's a great big if-else loop, uh, if-else tree. So we're taking in an object and we're going to check what's going on and then return what we think it's going to be. So we start at the top. Is it a void? No, it's not a void. We'll go to the next one. We need to check whether the tag from earlier matches the tag that we assume to be an object and because it's null, and a null pointer just happens to be the same tag as the object, we get into this part of the tree. There's some extra code in here to check whether it's a function. It's not, so we get into the else, and we return that it's an object, even though it's null, and then we return the type out the end. Yes, this is a bug. This is a very, very old, very well-known bug, and it is never going to be fixed because of the issue of backwards compatibility. There are no versions in JavaScript. Um, if you're lucky enough to uh, work in a language that does have versions, say Python, you can have Python 2 or you can have Python 3. You have no choice with JavaScript. And every browser has to implement the same standard so we get cross-browser compatibility, which means that if this was to, say, be fixed, uh, the internet would actually break because we can't rely on what users are going to be having to execute locally. So JavaScript isn't awful, it's awful, full of awe. There are a lot of issues, there are a lot of weird edge cases, so don't use JavaScript. As of today, you can implement things such as image sliders, modals, lightboxes, form validation, and file uploads only using HTML and CSS. You don't have to use JavaScript. With the um, adoption of HTML5, you can have app cache events, web sockets, service workers, web storage, all within native HTML5. You don't need to implement anything in JavaScript to use this sort of functionality. Or you could just uh, avoid JavaScript entirely and use a project that allows you to compile other languages into JavaScript. Um, but everything has to end up in JavaScript because browsers only accept JavaScript, and thank goodness because otherwise we would still be uh, using ActiveX and Flash. 
So pick a language, any language. There is bound to be a compiler for you. Uh, if you're a Ruby person, uh, there's Opal and Red. Opal, Ruby's puns. Uh, if PHP is your thing, you've got uh, Unita and Phype. Uh, Perl, there's several in there, including uh, P2JS. In Go, there's Go for JS. Uh, in Python, you have a couple of different choices. You have Sculpt and Brython, but you also have this wonderful thing called Batavia. Batavia does things a little bit differently. And I'm mentioning this specifically because I'm a core developer on Batavia and it, the logo's all over my skirt. Uh, Batavia is an implementation of the Python virtual machine in JavaScript. It's part of the Beware suite of tools. And if you have a time machine, all the recordings are going up very quickly. Uh, Russell Keith McGee was in one of the rooms earlier giving a talk about this. So you should watch that later. Um, but you don't have to use Python. You could say use Haskell. Uh, GHCJS or Haste will get you uh, compiled into JavaScript. Even COBOL. If you, you can write COBOL and get it parsed into JavaScript. Or with C, you can use something like Inscriptor, which is great because we have a lot of C programs around already. And so we have this example. This is the Internet Archive. The Internet Archive is wonderful. What I'm doing here is I am downloading game data. This is all JavaScript. I'm now running an emulation of DOSBox in my browser, which is then going to be running Windows 3.1 in my browser, including the wonderful tessellated uh, background there. And this is ski free. Yay! So we can. Yes, we can, we can play Ski Free and a whole bunch of other DOS games that for... <laughs> exactly! Um, all the DOS games have... No! The monster, the monster, because of the clock rate differences, the monster, you can never run away from it. The monster is always going to get you. No, I, I stopped it. <laughs> um, to, to ensure that these sort of programs are able to be used, because obviously incredibly important things like ski free need to be uh, shared with everyone, um, nobody, like not many people have a Windows 3.1 box anymore, but we can emulate it and we can still retain these software programs. And the Internet Archive is wonderful for this. But using all these cross compilers is fine if that's your thing. But using a language that's not JavaScript doesn't save you. I mean, you could use another language, but other languages have WATS as well. So let's talk about Ruby. In Ruby, Ruby doesn't have the concept of bare words. If you try to just put English or other words in your interpreter, it will error, saying that there's uh, undefined variables. However, you can define an overload for the method missing, which is what the compiler uses if it doesn't know what it's supposed to be doing function-wise, which means that we can declare something which it says, if we don't know what our method is, just join all the arguments together, which means that we can now just output this as a string. This is literally changing how the things are supposed to be interpreted, which means you get wonderful stuff like in Rails 2.0 where you could create a function name that is never actually declared anywhere and it would work out what you meant. So if you have a rational, a relational database, say customers, and you have a field called name, you just use uh, customer dot find all by last name and it would work out what method you meant, which makes it incredibly fun when that method isn't declared anywhere. That was fun to try to work out where is this method being declared when I was first using Rails. Let's talk about something else. Let's talk about Ruby. In Ruby, we can have uh, equality things. So if we have not true, double and true, is this going to be true or false? 50-50. Come on, true or false? True. No, false. <laughs> However, if we were to substitute that double and with the word and, we get true. The, this is because of the order of precedence goes double and, double or, pipe for an all and then not. And then so, so the double and and the double pipe haven't got the same order of precedence as the words. Yeah. But I'm not just going to pick on Ruby. Let's talk about Haskell. What is the length, what is the length of this array 1, 2? Two? 2. What is the length of this tuple 1, 2?
One. This is because of the way that Haskell deals with foldable and other, it, it's complicated. Um, let's talk about Haskell. So if we declare a variable A that is two plus two, what is A going to equal? Four. If we declare the variable B, which is two plus two, where two plus two equals five, what is B going to be? Five. This is completely valid because we are defining exactly what our inputs are going to be and functional programming, there's an entire another talk about how this works, but you can see when you come into another language, it's like, duh. That's a technical term, by the way. Let's talk about something else. Let's talk about Pascal. In Pascal, I can declare a program with a variable x that's an integer with a beginning and an end where we manipulate x. What do we expect the output of this program to be? True. This is because Pascal uses a operand for assignment that it doesn't look like a quality. And Pascal was one of the first languages apart from JavaScript that I've ever used and it's like, assignment is not a quality. This is wonderful. I actually know the difference between what assignment and what a quality is because there are languages where they're the same operand. And that was really wonderful. Other things that then trip me up because it's like, oh, it's really easy to do uh, integers and, and, and math and stuff. And then I hit bash. Um, what, is the, what is the output of uh, 4 plus 2? Command not found. <laughs> well, that's OK. Um, we can use like dollar sign and, and brackets and wrap it around. And then we can totally uh, work out what this is equal, right? Command not found. <laughs> we'll just put around more brackets. Six. No. <laughs> You then have to echo out that to actually get the six. And that's fine because bash isn't supposed to do that. There are ways you need to actually make it do the things. Another obscure example, uh, Elixir. In Elixir, if we wanted to do a map of a square root of a range of numbers, say one to five, it would look like this and then we would get out an array which is one to five squared. However, if we were to do the exact same thing, but with the range 6 to 10, we get that. <laughs> so this is because of how Elixir is referring the second range as a, as a string. Now, I'm sure this is just me playing around with a new language and not realizing that, yes, this is a thing. But based on what other languages do, I think I'm OK, but I'm not. Let's talk about C. What is the output of this? White pipe. This is because this is C++, specifically C++11, which does not implement ASCII. There is no pipe character in C++11. What you need to do is you need to use trigraphs to be able to use the extended character set that is not in ISO that. Now, I can hear some mumbling in the audience. This is if you don't have on some sort of global flag or whatever, but this is still something that in the version of C++ that I was using, um, when I'm trying to print out error statements and trying to find them in my code and working out why my what is not coming out. Yeah. Let's talk about something else. Let's talk about Python. So if A is the integer 256 and B is the integer 256, is AB? Yes. If A is 257 and B is 257, is AB? No. no. But if you declare them on the same line, they are. <laughs> yes. Let's talk about Python. If we have X, which is a byte array, and then we have an empty dict, what would be the modulus of a byte array and an empty dict? Any guesses? An empty byte array in Python 3.5, but if in Python 3.6, it's slightly different. These are the kind of fun things that you find when you try to re-implement uh, Python in JavaScript. So this is now being backported as of 3.5.3, which I think has already been released. And these things are now going to be equal because X is supposed to be that, and you can't modulus a byte array. Well, you can modulus a it's, it's complicated. Talk to Russell earlier, he found this, uh, later. Talk to Russell later, because earlier he found this. Words. Let's talk about Java. 
If I have an integer a that is uh, 1024 and I have an integer b that is 1024, is a less than or equal to b? True. Is a greater than or equal to b? Yes. So a is equal to b. This is to do with integer caching, which is another fun barrel of monkeys. Let's talk about Scala. What would be the output of the printing of this? Any guesses? <laughs> ABC from the front. So this is because Scala uses completely different punctuation to a whole lot of other languages. So the braces is an empty function, and the concatenation of an empty function into an empty string is an empty result. And if you're unfamiliar with the syntax of Scala, then it can throw you for six. Let's talk about Swift. In Swift, if I declare a cat cafe with a whole bunch of cats, this is just a static uh, nested array. And then I want to print out the number of cats in my nested array. And I time how long that takes. I get 15, but it takes nearly 14 minutes. <laughs> This has been fixed because previously, if you kept on adding, say, cat element number 16, 17, it could run days because of an issue with the uh, complexity and optimizational properties of Swift, but that's now been fixed. Let's talk about Perl. I want to check the equality of foo and bar. If they are equal, I want to print true. If they're not, I want to print false. What does this output? True, because double equals in Perl is numeric equality, not string equality. And it will cast those strings to be zero, and thus they are equal. Finding this bug in the middle of a very monolithic Perl system, that was fun. Let's talk about PHP. In PHP, we can have ternary operators. This means that if I want to work out if something, uh, the boolean of something, uh, the result, of what a Boolean is means that I either execute the left-hand side or the right-hand side of the column there. So for true, it prints out true. If it's false, it prints out the right-hand side false. We can also chain these together. So if my value is false, then I go to the second one. If the value is false again, then I go down, and so it's three. If I change it, so if it's false, then I go into the second line true, it'll print two. But if I have both of them to be true. This is because ternary operands in PHP are left associative. <laughs> this one is fun. phpsadness.com has a whole lot more of these. Let's talk about PowerShell. In PowerShell, if I want to check whether 2 is greater than 1, it'll print out true, else it'll print out false. So is 2 greater than 1? Yeah, duh. It, these, aren't, these aren't trick questions. <laughs> what about if uh, is uh, two less than one? <laughs> I think you get the idea by now. All languages have quirks. Some are legitimate bugs in the language. Some are only whats because users may not know what's going on. And if you don't understand what the language is doing, it can bite you. And this is why JavaScript is awful, because if you don't understand what JavaScript is doing, it can hurt you. But it's evolving, because now we have things like JavaScript outside the browser and things like Node.js. Now, the only reason I mention this is because the V8 engine, which is the JavaScript engine that powers uh, both server and uh, server-side and client-side JavaScript, or universal JavaScript, is extremely powerful, but it also has a really wonderful WAP that I found. If we have a function, that has a great big comment, just ignore that. And all we're doing is just looping around the addition of some variables and timing how long it takes. It takes just under two seconds. See that great big comment block? If I remove the last line, it goes three times faster. <laughs> this is because there is, there is a specific optimization route in V8 that specifically applies different optimization functions if the function that I'm giving it is under 600 characters, including comments. Something I'll also touch on briefly is package management. Our NPM is uh, one of the many package managers, uh, Node Package Manager, uh, sort of like your cheese shop or Ruby Gems. 
Um, if you're not familiar with this particular package manager, you may have uh, heard about it because of that. Now, I'm not bringing up LeftPad as a cheap joke. There's a whole bunch of history about what happened here. But what I want to show you is the uh, infamous 11 lines. This is a function that will left pad a string. We work out if we're given a character to pad, or if we're not giving a character to pad, we have space. We work out how many characters we want to pad based on how many is left in the length of the string when we want to uh, run this. And then for as many characters we need, we add the function there. This is the same function, but known as stirpad in PHP. It's got the same sort of properties. We have a uh, default variable, which is space. We work out the length, and then we cycle through as many as we need. This is because PHP has a standard library and JavaScript doesn't. There are many base functions, there's a lot of base functionality in that just doesn't exist in JavaScript that a lot of other languages have. And this is where we get workarounds, because left pad is just one of the countless thousands of workarounds that have been implemented because of the lack of functionality in JavaScript. And this is where you get bigger projects like jQuery and Bootstrap, because standard libraries are nice and helpful. But JavaScript is improving. So all, most of the examples so far I've given are from the ECMA 3 standard from 1999. They tried to make an ECMA 4, um, but it was abandoned. Uh, the entire version of the language was skipped. Now, this isn't uncommon. Uh, PHP 6 isn't a thing um, because of issues that I don't nearly have enough time to describe. Uh, and whatever happened to Windows 9? No, the Windows 9 thing, who knows what the Windows 9 thing is about, why there's no Windows 9? OK, for those who don't know, it's because you have Windows 95 and Windows 98, and a whole lot of programmers went, oh, if it's one of these platforms, I can just check whether the OS string is Windows 9 something or if it has Windows 9 in it. So if you have the ability for programs in, say, 64-bit architecture to think that it's in 16-bit architecture, no. So let's just skip one. So ECMAScript 3 was from 1999, and ECMAScript 5 is from 2009. There are 10 years where JavaScript didn't change, and a lot happened on the internet between 1999 and 2009, like a lot, like an entire dot-com bubble. So with ECMAScript 5, we, they finally made a basis to start improving the language, such as isArray, because now there is a function in ES5 which is isArray, which means that the object we had from earlier is not an array, but the array we had earlier is, which is great. We also have improvements in parseInt, because by default we had an issue where it was assumed that something starting with a zero was octal. But now this works, because the assumed default base radix is now base 10, because a lot of things are base 10. And you don't have to declare that, but it'll assume it's base 10 and not try to work out whether it's an octal or a hex based on what the string is. We also have things like map. Map is so fun. Uh, with map, what we can do is we can apply a method across an array of things. So if we have one, two, three, and we want to apply math square root to it, we get the square roots. However, ah, oh yes, that this wumbles. Um, so what we're doing is applying this function across all the things. However, if you were to declare, say, an array of things and then passing an array into, say, parseInt, because parseInt has that optional parameter from earlier, you get some weird results. So when you're using map in JavaScript, just be careful about what your functionality is using. Beware of optional parameters. Uh, 18 months ago, ECMAScript 6 allows us to have actual scoping now with things like let. So what we can do instead of having var in there, we can have let which means that um, the scope extends only to that block and we get an error if we try to redeclare that variable anywhere. And import, we are getting import. Import, for those who don't know, normally when you're doing old school importing and have a HTML file, you have to use script tags for every single file you want. Once this gets introduced globally, what you'll be able to do is export functions and import them. And this really excites me. <laughs> um, and the most recent version is now a, and a yearly release cycle. So every year there's going to be updates to it. Now, 
Up until 2006, the canonical JavaScript standard document was a lovingly maintained Word document, and now it's not. So there's a whole lot less overhead for the uh, standards committee to be able to improve it, which means that there's going to be uh, ECMAScript 8 that's going to have fancy things like decorators, possibly. Um, every year there's going to be more and more fun functionality. And working out exactly what browsers have implemented, exactly what things can be worked out using a compatibility table at that URL. Or if you don't want to look at a table of adoption details, you can look at Shiny. So this is uh, Mariko Kasoka has done this wonderful drawing. And the dev versions of Canary and Mozilla Nightly, as soon as code lands, it's in these things. And then things slowly move over. But the main thing is the, oh my god, new version emoji. Um, every six weeks, there is a new Chrome stable release. Every six weeks, there's a new Firefox release. Edge, about two or three a year, and Safari, about one or two a year. So it's, it's about a year between when things come from the, into Canary and into Nightly. But it also means that if you run your updates, you get your new Shiny. And you may get new emoji if you run your new updates and security patches. You should update your operating systems. Um, extending JavaScript. If you don't have any uh, way to update the different functionality and stuff, what you can do is you can do something called polyfill, where we can declare if we don't have uh, a function, we can say, if, we, if this function doesn't exist, we'll declare it anyway. So pad start is going to be in the ECMA standard, which is a native standard library for left pad. And it's just a bit of code. That's fine. Um, but the top two lines there is saying, if we haven't got this declared, then we're going to declare this extension of the string prototype. And you can extend the language like that. So you can have is array, which is going to be a triple equals equality on the string object array. But that works. That is all you need to do to work out whether something is an array. However, as of a yet to be formally published draft document from W3C, polyfills can cause problems. There is a bunch of recommendations that are in this document that's linked. My slide link is at the end. Um, there's a whole bunch of recommendations about considering how you need to serve all users of your, of your website, not just the ones with the latest browsers, um, including those with a slower and less capable devices, especially mobile. So hopefully I've shown that JavaScript isn't awful. It's or full. It's full of awe. Even with its edge cases, it's extremely power powerful and it's important. There are many people that develop in JavaScript. There are many people that use JavaScript. The people that develop in JavaScript aren't bad people or lesser people because they use a language that has arguably flawed design issues. There's, I don't nearly have enough time to explain why this is a problem. But thankfully, uh, the morning keynote from WootConf, Oren Shaw, does an entire talk about this. So I recommend that you watch this video. And that's all I had. Thank you very much. And I'm not going to be taking any questions now, but I'm here all week. If you want to uh, tell me that I'm wrong, don't talk to me. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.